everyone, this is my spoiler-packed review for the movie Glass. If you're new to one of my spoiler reviews, they're a different format than my usual content. It doesn't have all the fancy editing. It doesn't have all the clips. It's just me, essentially podcast style, talking about everything in the movie that I couldn't say in my normal review. Also, as I go into these, I'm assuming that you've already watched my spoiler-free review that has my overall feelings about the film. Those cover the big, broad ideas and then the specific points that I want to talk about or that I had to hold back in my review. This is where I dive into the specifics and plot points and scenes and all the stuff I couldn't say. I'm going to talk about it here. So if you have not seen the movie Glass yet, Leave this video, go watch the movie class, then go watch my spoiler-free video, then come and watch this video and join the spoiler-filled conversation. With that in mind, join me down in the comment section, share your thoughts on the movie class. And this is a spoiler review, so go crazy hog wild talking about specific plot points. There's no fear at all of uh, spoiling anything that, um, because you shouldn't be in the comment section if you haven't seen the movie yet. So with all of that said, we're going to get started. Actually, I should say um, I'm sort of losing my voice a little bit. I've been kind of sickish the last few days. Really bad cough. Earlier today, I recorded two different interviews that were all both about an hour long. And so <coughs> like I said, I have got a cough and cold and everything. So if I talk too much, if I exert myself, I'll start coughing. Just so you know what's going on as we go into this video and why I sound a little bit different from normal. And with that said, we're going to get started talking about Glass and we'll kick it off uh, with our update on where David Dunn is in life. And I just loved the way that the, the movie starts. And as soon as the credits start rolling and they put the intro credits, we see a crime committed. And you're thinking, oh, are we going to get to see him in action? And then it cuts to these guys back at their apartment. And, you know, they're talking about the Superman punch and took the guy down with one one punch knock or yeah, one punch knockout power. And you're going, oh, it's about to go down. And then, of course, uh, David Dunn shows up to uh, exact vengeance upon the people. And then he goes home and we learn that he now has his own security company, which is a nice little life upgrade for him. Just seeing that because, you know, he is a security guard before working hourly rate and things like that. It's like, yeah, shouldn't maybe he could be doing more than this. And then knowing he's running a security company, it just feels like his life really did come together because of the events of the previous film. And he starts walking through the place and we're, it, we're, it's revealed that his... Um, you know, person in the watchtower, the person that's giving him his intel is his son, Joseph, which is I just thought was a great touch, especially that they were able to bring the the um, the actor back. And now he's a 30 year old man, 31 year old man. And I, that's just a really cool, nice little touch. And he still he still has it. He feels like the grown up version of the kid that we saw 19 years ago, except now is the grown man that still idolizes his dad. It's just a really nice little detail that that was able to work out um, that felt right because the, the son in the first in Unbreakable loved his dad, was idolizing him, a little bit unstable, a little bit quirky and weird. And all of that is still true inside of this movie. And then as it, it starts to establish the pieces in this, as we know, the Beast has kidnapped some more girls and they're trying to track him down. Uh, we learn that the police are looking for David Dunn. Um, and so there's this sense like you got to be careful. And I love the fact that David Dunn won't back down. He's just this different guy from who we saw in the first film. He like both the events of that film and the 19 years have made him into a guy that like, I, I don't care if the police are after me. There's some girls that are in danger and I need to go and rescue them. So it leads to this very nice little scene as he wants to go out for a walk. And then his son doesn't want him to go out for a walk and they're going back and forth. And then we get our uh, mandatory M night uh, cameo standing there at the counter. And he's like, dude, let your dad go for a walk. And then they have the nice back and forth where it's revealed that the cameo of his character in all three of the movies in this trilogy are the same, um, which, it, you know, it could have been a little bit of a, you know, 
movie cheat in there that he had different cameos in Split and Unbreakable, but then this movie kind of ties it together of like, no, 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 it's, it's the same guy. And just with a little line of saying, oh, I had some trouble and I recognized you from way back in the day. I was running with a bad crowd and had to get reformed from, from some of that stuff. I thought that was a real nice little detail. So then David's walking the street in the area where we, they suspected there might be some action, Runs across, I, I believe it was Hedwig, um, walking down the street. He gets the visions of everything going down, which leads him to go to set, rescue the girls. The Beast returns. Have a nice, our first little showdown between the two of them. And once again, just a nice little moment for David to get to be the hero. For us to fully see him as the guy, that potential we wanted to see. I just love that whole first beginning section as he got as we got to see that potential um, demonstrated for us. And just the little details it gave us that he really did become the hero, that uh, he appears to have told his wife that they stayed together, that his son still idolizes him, that his, his career took off. Uh, everything about his life was good. And so as we move into the things in the third act and where where all of this leads to, what we know is because of that first movie, he really did a lived a good life that mattered, that helped people, that saved people. And so as, as the certain feelings you might have at the end of the film uh, that are negative, the beginning of the film makes them a little bit obsolete in, in a certain sense, in that he... He got to be the hero. We didn't get to see those 19 years of adventures. It would have been nice if M. Night had found a way to tell us some story 10 years ago or like, and then the adventure of Winnie and whatever it would have been, Unbreakables or whatever from 10 years ago. That would have been cool. We didn't get it. But what we know is he did do all that stuff for 19 years, lived a good life. His marriage was saved. He was a good father. They've got an amazing relationship. And then he wrestles the beast and have some nice action in there. They fall out the window and lights shine and we're introduced to our Sarah Paulson character. I don't actually remember what the doctor's name was. Um, and, you know, she David Dunn, we knew you were going to be out here and she's tracked him down. And this leads us to the body of the film, which is at the psych psychiatric ward. And I, for me, I was, I hated this, <laughs> the <clears throat> psychiatrist lady character because she just seemed obviously so dumb like that like why are, why why aren't you like paying attention how do you not know whether there's things going on here and then uh so right at first i just hated her for you know trying to undo like not believing them and thinking that they're just crazy and then as they started to dig into some of this stuff and they started to like present this worldview of like like what if like just these traumas caused you to believe something. What if you are just this, uh, David, you just have a gift for instinctively putting the pieces together and you're not like a trained in any of this stuff. You're just really good at it. That's a real thing that a person can have. There's people that are just really strong. You could be a person like that. And then you just, because you were lucky in a train, cra uh, train wreck, you think that you're unbreakable because you've got a couple of gifts and you got lucky. And I was watching the movie as they started like really breaking down some of these ideas. And I started to think to myself, like, is that where this is going? Because I'd heard all the rumors that people hated the third act. I was like, like, is, is that like, did he pull a fast one on us? Did we see stuff that wasn't there? Like, should I be doubting myself? Because they showed me him touch people and he put the thoughts together and, and she starts describing like, what if that's just what it was? And that you just start to, you just, and you go, oh, I, is he breaking down his own movies, breaking down his own mythology? That That's a bold move. I could see why some people would be mad about that. But then they just kept building the case for it of like, what if, um, you know, these sorts of, Having being the best at something instinctive in seeing things and putting it all together just in your mind without even having to think about it, that in a certain way is superhuman. It doesn't mean that you have to have superpowers with mystical abilities. Um, you just and so it's like, is that where this is going? That's that's an interesting little twist. Um, but it made me doubt what I saw. It made me the way the characters were doubting. I was kind of doubting, doubting things and rethinking. It was like, OK, all right. M. Night, you're messing with my head a little bit. You're getting the character to mess with my head. I don't know that I like, like that she's doing all of this. And then we discover while we're here that Mr. Glass is uh, kind of in a you know comatose state. He just sits there um, fidgeting, acting kind of crazy and kooky all the time. 
um, and uh, disconnected from reality. And throughout the movie, um, we learn a little bit more about all of that. Um, so in the body of the movie, I didn't have necessarily has many um, things to think about, uh, talk about. Um, even as I was making my notes to do this video, the middle of the movie uh, just kind of felt like it stood on its own. It explored these ideas about is this real, is this not? We get McAvoy doing a lot of McAvoy type stuff. We get Elijah Price sitting there in his chair and see it like, but there wasn't a lot of like spoiler type things like that I wanted to dig into on the uh, specific plot points because it's just exploring the ideas of the movie, um, which was some of, some of that was fun. And then seeing them having a counseling session together um, was, was interesting. In this section, I guess where there was some, some got a little bit odd to me is the, so they bring, uh, bring the Casey character back and the use of the character, I wasn't quite sure if it if it felt right to me. Um, that so she seems really interested in wanting to help the horde and wanting to help Kevin Wendell Crumb, and uh, in the somewhat idea there seems to be that it's because uh, of the, his of her experience with him, she was given the strength to bring down her horrible um, uncle, and so that 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 was kind of a interesting little twist. I, I just don't know that I fully bought her being so proactive about trying to go to uh, him. And then, you know, we, we sort of learn a little bit later in the movie as to why our psychiatrist character would allow certain things. But uh, it's just a little bit interesting that uh, the, the, at watching it through the first time, it was like, why would a psychiatrist let a victim into the room with the, like this does not seem right. There's like about 50,000 reasons that this wouldn't go down. And so when you know what happens later on, it, it makes a little bit more sense. But that first view is like, uh, I'm not quite so sure about this. So that was a bit odd to me. Uh, it's fun to see Joseph trying to like lie and uh, talk his way, uh, convince the uh, him that his dad was just pulling a hoax and he's really bad at it. And then she kind of turns it around on him and starts doing psychology on him and it starts to mess with his head a little bit um, and causes him to doubt and rethink, like goes to the gym and like, okay, those guys are just as strong as what my dad did. Uh, hmm. He starts rethinking a few things. Um, and then a nice touch related to that is that um, I guess this movie includes several deleted scenes from Unbreakable, I believe. And I'm pretty sure I saw them on the, it's been years and years and years since I watched them. But as I was watching the movie, uh, it starts showing some of these scenes like Mr. Glass at the fair, uh, the scene with Joseph walks in after the weightlifting scene. And I know I've seen those before, but they're not in the movie, Unbreakable. And so it's like, I guess there were deleted scenes that were on the DVD and they then incorporated them into the film. And I thought that was a very interesting, nice little touch to um, find a way to give more backstory and show some stuff from different perspectives that you, know, you obviously couldn't have done um, uh, if they didn't have some of that footage. So that, that was a nice little detail that I enjoyed. And so eventually we start to learn that Mr. Glass is sneaking around a little bit and is up to no good. Um, and some of that, that's where the movie starts to have, I think, a few more little hiccups in the storytelling. The first one where it seemed to really pop a little bit is so he gets out and he starts rolling around. He goes, sees uh, the horde, talks to them, goes back to his room and it cuts to the next day. And they've been talking about this surgery, this surgery, this surgery, this surgery. So it cuts to, they're just waking him up and like, we saw you on video. We got to do this surgery now. And so then they take him and they shoot the laser at him and supposedly did the surgery on him. And then we learn they did not do this. Like he, part of his scheme in escaping was that he had all sorts of tricks and he knew where cameras were going to be at. So they'd see him. And so they would think things had happened. But in reality, he'd snuck off and he'd stolen a piece of the device. And seems there's there's a lot of convenience and contrivances in sort of the inside of this scheme of his, even to the level that he's got the piece from the machine in his room seems like something someone would pick up on. But that like uh, they have the they don't really describe what the surgery machine does exactly. It's not, not entirely clear how it's supposed to work. And then as like no one notices that there's there's a part missing and it doesn't change anything. It just seemed a little bit like lazy writing 
that um, the way this played out and that he would know how to what to remove and then how to remove it in a way that they wouldn't notice. And they would it, it, it's like having a master plan that's, you know, screenwriter trickery rather than a master plan where you go, oh, that's really that makes a lot of sense. This one was like, ah, I'm spending a lot of time trying to think about how would that work? How did they not notice this? How would they not notice what? Something probably should have struck them as odd about <coughs> um, how all of this kind of played out. But so he has his master plan and the guy comes in. The um, to, uh, We get to the point in time where Mr. Glass is going to start his master plan and escape. And the guy comes in and notices the pictures are crooked on the wall. And, oh, your pictures are crooked on the wall. And he sits down right in front of Mr. Glass. And you just see a hand go like that. And, oh, it's going down. It's going down. And like, the, like, we know that he sabotaged stuff to kill people before, but we've never seen him. The guy with the blade killing somebody. So a nice little touch, like him getting in on the action, kills the guy. And then we start to move into our third act with uh, uh, all, all the details working um, in it. So, um Big moments in the third act that kind of struck stuck with me. Um, I wish they'd done more with the David escape to make it a little bit more potent. I felt like that scene could have. Uh, I, I felt like it could have dug down deeper into it. Does he doubt himself? Like, does he really believe that he can do this or not? I think it could have like held on to that note a little bit, and him breaking through the door. Uh, like is him proving to himself like I this was not a this was not a daydream this was not a delusion this wasn't something I needed to believe uh, I believe this this is real she can't explain everything away and, and I just thought that's that moment could have been one of these power moments like in Unbreakable he, M. Night finds a way with to, of a guy falling into a pool and being pulled up by kids and the guy just standing up in the rain is this powerful moment. And I thought we could have done a little bit of a stronger moment like that and have the unbreakable music start playing as it, as it kind of unfolds. And as he realizes he does believe uh, I would, it, it just could have hit a little bit better, I think. So he gets out and around the, uh, we, we got several different you know things kind of going on with a lot of different characters. And so um, Mr. Glass says they have to escape through the basement. So he's going through the basement um, and taking guys out. So some nice little details in that. And then you've got David goes back to the storage room to get his superhero costume, the jacket thing, uh, no, a poncho. Um, he goes to get his poncho. And this is where the movie starts having, once again, some directorial problems. Pretty much here until the end of the film, I thought they're directorially, it got kind of clunky. Um, as the just the timing of all of it starts to get really odd as to, uh, where are characters at and how, how, why is it taking so long for them to get to these different places and how it, what, why, why aren't they there yet? And so that I st immediately, as soon as David's like putting his jacket on and then they're showing people running down this hallway and then a lady, re the Sarah Paulson realizes that they're escaping all the, it didn't feel like the timelines lined up properly and why are people taking, uh, it got odd at that point in time for me. And so in my review, when I said it was clunky, that that's the sort of stuff that I'm talking about. And I'll talk about a little bit more as we move into our final showdown. So one of my big problems with the finale of this film is that I, and I mentioned this in my review, is that the movie tells us we are moving towards we're going to that skyscraper building where Elijah Price is going to blow up a building. And then while the whole world is watching all of this, David and the Beast will duke it out in front of all of them. The movie tells us that is what we are moving towards, towards the stereotypical superhero big showdown. It says that is coming. So as you're watching the movie and what happens is they run to the front area of a psychiatric ward that has a view of a building in the background. It's not a very cinematic finale. It's not a big, it's not a big sequence uh, of any sorts of the imagination, which 
We're coming off of Unbreakable, which is not a movie that was full of big spectacle. We're coming off of Split that is not a movie with big spectacle. In fact, Split is a very restrained movie in very few locations in all contained locations. Uh, Unbreakable had a lot more to it. It was a bigger movie, but not a spectacle movie. So why is this a problem that we're battling it on a parking lot? Because the movie just told us, it told us, we're going to a building that's going to blow up and then two mega power people are going to battle it out while the world watches. And so as you're watching the movie and they start fighting in a parking lot, you're not thinking this is the final battle. You're like, okay, this is the start of the final battle and it's going to keep going because that's what the movie told us. So then as you're watching some of this um, and you start to piece together, like, I think this is it. The natural feeling that you have when you're watching a movie that told me we're going to get this and you're like, hmm more like this, it's disappointment. That's a normal reaction to what they just promised us and what they're delivering. And so we get some nice um, David Dunn beast moments as they're slash smashing each other into cars. None of it's as good as you want it to be, though. None of it is just like slam bang awesome stuff happening here. And really the power moments are some of the stuff when you have the big reveal, when it's when it's told to Kevin Wendell Crumb, um, the train you got on, that's the same one that Elijah blew up. Like that, like the way that all this went down, the way that this happened, it, it, it'll go, it goes back to him. Like he's responsible for all of this, which is, um, I, I mean, I have to stop and think about the logic of this one of, um, is the reason that Kevin Wendell Crumb didn't know that Mr. Glass was responsible for this is because he's He's had all these personalities. And so then he's, he's just a broken person. Because you would think, I mean, David Dunn cracked the news story. Or he tracked him down. It's um, like that's public information. So why does Kevin not know that information that would have been public for 19 years at the point in time of this movie? Is that because of the personality, because of all the other stuff? So he didn't have information that would have been public information. Um, so I don't know if that's a plot hole or if I'm missing a little detail in there, but um, as for the audience, it's new information for us. So it's a little bit, a little bit of a powerful, like, oh, it is all connected. That's, that's kind of cool. And it at leads to kind of that nice little moment where the beast, of course, now is going to take out the person that's hurting it, that hurt Kevin. So that power, painful and powerful moment where the beast punch, <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, punches Mr. Glass in the chest, <clears throat> collapses to the ground. And I mean, it's just, oh. But at the same time, uh, David Dunn steps up to defend Mr. Glass, which just has that nice, nice balance to it. So they, they break out into their fight uh, or continue their, their fight at this point in time and move towards the undoing of all of this, our water container deal. Um, and so they battle it out in there, pop out on the other side of it. David Dunn is choking out from being in the water. And um, around right around the same time, we've got Casey runs up to him to get him out of beast mode, calls out Kevin Wendell Crumb. And this is where the whole thing starts to get turned upside down. And so he wakes up and then phew, gets shot in the chest. I, I guess I skipped over the part of there where the SWAT team shows up. David Dunn puts the guys into the, the locker, which seemed a little bit like the pace, like the rate at which David is like moving these guys, bends the metal bars, seemed like this very leisurely pace in light of everything going on, bends it, and he keeps bending it to keep them in there. It keeps bending it, which makes for nice footage for later in the movie. But at the moment, it's like, I, doesn't he need to go get the beast? Doesn't he need to go stop that other guy over there? Once again, to some of the direction feeling like it, the, it just seemed like the pieces didn't quite fit together, so we had to kind of mash it a little bit to make things work. So he locks them up. Fast forward to where we were just at. Sniper guy takes out kind of a Kevin Wendell Crumb because he does not have the strength of the beast. He goes down. David is kind of struggling on the ground, and then someone walks up and starts putting a boot on his foot to push his head into the water. And to me, this this was this is the thing that's unforgivable in the movie. Um. They killed David Dunn by having him get thrown into a water container that he escapes. So he's weakened from that. And then he's like pathetically like laying on the ground and someone puts a boot on his head, 
starts mashing his head in the water. And then someone goes, wait, wait, touch my hand. Oh, so you can know the truth. Hey, I would have let you keep doing what you were doing, but the horde came and we have to have balance. And so just so you know, like, like we're not the bad guys. We're not the good guys. We're the people that keep the balance in all of this. So just so you know, all right, boot him. And then boots his head in the ground. And so the guy that was the star of the first movie, the hero of all of this, uh, not only does he die a pathetic death, he doesn't get like a final monologue, doesn't get a final line. He doesn't die sacrificially. He dies like just with a camera shooting under the water, I think is the angle that they give as he, he dies. And, I, and I'm wondering like, what was Joseph doing? Is Joseph like standing 10 feet away? Like, hey, come on, dude, stop, stop. Like, like the details of exactly how some of this stuff like the way it worked out, I didn't even understand like why isn't some of these other characters doing something jump like I, I don't understand what, how this is exactly playing out once again to directorially it seemed a little bit shaky towards the end. So then boot on head um, and he, he dies. And then Kevin Wendell Crumb gets his final monologue as he dies. Mr. Glass gets a final monologue and talk chat with his mom and you know you are stupendous you're fantastic or whatever her line was to him david dunn face first in water boot on head killed by some random guy as we learn and our movie gets hijacked suddenly by whoever these people are that we now learn are the real bad guys inside of all this that want to keep the superheroes a secret. And so they decide that they have to kill all three of these guys off because they weren't able to convince them that they didn't have powers. And we realize, oh, we get our M. Night Shyamalan twist, turn it all upside down. That's what's really been going on all along in this movie. And that's why the lady was saying all this stuff. Um, and she was trying to trick them to keep them alive. So she's not so bad after all. Not good, but not as bad as she potentially could be. Um, and then for some reason, they let Joseph, Mama Glass, and Casey leave. Even though they just watched it. Like, we just learned that they'll, they'll kill a hero uh, in cold blood. Uh, and then they see these three people that are, like, mad. Like, How, why'd you kill my dad? Joseph's yelling at him for probably because, you know, for obvious reasons. And they're like all right, we got to go now. And they wave goodbye. I don't know how that moment played out that they just left and thought that Joseph wouldn't do something about this. That's what I was wondering. Like, is like the final scene going to be like, uh, cause I guess, uh, uh, Mr. Glass said something like this was always an origin story. So it's like, does this mean that Joseph's going to become the punisher and the final scene in the movie is him shooting the lady in the head or something? Like where exactly is this going? Um, and so then um, cuts to her saying her plan, meeting with her peoples. And then we realize the final reveal in all of this is that Mr. Glass <laughs> did have a master plan. And much like a lot of this movie, there's misdirection stuff going on. We got our big turnaround that he hacked the cameras so that they would be recorded off site and then sent off to the three sidekicks characters, the three, uh, yes, three sidekicks to each of these people will get a copy of it. And, um, you know, hopefully they will get together and do something with this information. So our Sarah Paulson character learns this she screams in the hallway is like, uh Oh, she's failed. And then we get the final scene where, um, the three of them sit down at the station. They've released it to the internet and then it starts playing. And so what the end of the movie, really the way it ends up playing out is it creates a scenario where there's a worse villain than the people that we thought were the real villains. And our three characters, our three lead characters all get to be victorious in their own way um, and get, get something positive to happen that can feel, feel satisfying in it. So Kevin Wendell Crumb, uh, the beast gets to ultimately do what he meant to do. And he avenges Kevin's father's death. And so it's, he kills the guy responsible for all the pain. And so it takes out the ultimate person that has, has wronged him, wronged Kevin. Um, David Dunn, by the end of the movie, like even though he's defeated, Mr. Glass is taken out and the beast is defeated. So the villains that he was trying to stop 
they have been stopped. Um, and so that's a good thing. And other bad guys get taken out as well. And then as for Mr. Glass, obviously, he gets to be a hero too. And he's responsible for taking down all these other people. And he's responsible now for more superheroes, supervillains as well, being uh, uh, revealed to the world because this agency is now exposed. And so... You know, you start to um, you can add, there's a sense in which we get a totally different victory than we were expecting. If you wanted to just see David Dunn at the end of the movie, do, putting a beat down on Mr. Glass and the Beast or whatever, uh, we, we don't get that. M. Night totally plays against our expectations and he delivers a surprise. There's another villain and this other victory. And um, it's tough to know how I, I still don't fully know. Like, I I really like that he didn't give me the obvious thing. And I was kind of worried when they said, we're going to go to the, we're going to go to the towers and we're going to have a big showdown. And I was like, is that, I've heard all these rumors that people hate the last 15 minutes. Is it in the last 15 minutes is the beast and David Dunn going to start flying around buildings and have heat vision. And like, he goes for it. Like, is that what this is? And he just tried to pander by giving us exactly what we wanted. No, he doesn't do that. He does the opposite. Oh, you wanted a big showdown? There's a showdown, but nope, there's a different bad guy. And you want a victory? You want this movie to end on an impactful mo moment? I'm going to do that, but it's a totally different one than you were expecting. That's cool. Does it fully satisfy me? I'm not quite sure. Would I have preferred to have more of a lot more David Dunn as the hero? Yeah. Do I want David Dunn to die a heroic death? Yeah. Did I want him to die with his face in a puddle? No, not at all. And so it's 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 a tough mix for me to to know what to make of of some of it because it's I appreciate that he did something different. There's a lot of moments I think he should have put in there. And then I think there's just some there was some lazy writing in there of okay, we're gonna kill off David Dunn. And we're gonna kill him off in a way that is um uh setting up all these other characters. Okay. The way you do that is him laying on the ground, pathetic, having a boot on his head. That just feels like the first draft. It doesn't feel like they really thought it through. Like there's so many things that it could have played out of uh, him rescuing some, something else happening or something just even more tragic where they like legitimately, I don't know. I, I don't know what it, what it, I don't have a, my scene I would have written, but I'm not M. Night. I haven't been writing this for 19 years, so um it just of all the things to do for such an important moment, I that's the thing that's unforgivable to me. So it's an interesting movie, uh, true to M Night of doing something different, and I suspect um, time will be a little bit friendly to this one. I don't think it'll turn everyone around. I, th I think there's things about it that are legitimately not 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 good, but I think a lot of people once they get past the initial shock of I didn't get what I wanted, I got something different that they'll start to come around a little bit more to it. And some people a little bit more mixed. When you watch the movie, knowing what it is and where it's going, I think they'll like it a little bit more, is what I suspect. So as for me, as I said in my ranking of the movies earlier today, or yesterday, um, since I'm filming this the day that I posted, and I'm posting this one the day after I filmed it, um, that... Uh, this is my middle favorite. Uh, I liked it more than Split on first viewing, and I imagine that it'll stay that way, and I like Unbreakable the most by, by quite a bit. So that's my take on the movie. Like I said, I'm not feeling great. My voice is uh, almost gone entirely by now. Uh, tell me your thoughts down below in the comments section. Thank you guys so much for watching, and keep talking movies too much.